Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So happy to have you here. If you are new, welcome. So today we're going to be talking about the Murdoch family. And this case has had me interested for quite some time now. And I really wanted to do a deep dive in and try to make some sense. This one is going to be confusing because it's several cases in one. Today, we're going to be talking about privilege. We're going to be talking about some very suspicious deaths. We're going to be talking about a deadly boat accident, a double homicide, a failed murder for hire, and $8 million in embezzled funds. This one is going to be crazy and it could get a little confusing. So try your best to follow along because there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of people here and a lot of separate incidents that kind of all tie back together. But before we get started, today's video is brought to you by my brand, Higher Love Wellness. And I'm really excited to let you guys know that we are running an anniversary sale this week. This company was started by my husband and I, and every year on our wedding anniversary, we like to have an anniversary sale. This will actually be our second year of this sale. So it will run from June 4th, which is our anniversary, to June 14th, and we are running 15% percent off site wide. Now, some of you probably didn't even know that I have a CBD brand. I do. And I haven't talked about it that many times on my channel, mainly because we're a super small brand. It's taken us a long time to get to where we're at and to have enough supply to even bring it to my channel. Plus YouTube is a little bit behind the game here with CBD. Um, they used to flag every time we talked about it. So mm. Now we're good, I think, we'll see. But CBD is legal in all 50 states and most countries and we ship to all 50 states and a lot of countries, not all of them. We're still working on a few. But let me tell you about a few of my favorite things that we carry. Most recently we launched our pet line and I love how these products turned out. Plus my pets love how these products turned out. We carry a CBD oil for dogs and cats that comes in unflavored and chicken flavor and also comes in two potencies, a thousand milligrams and 500 milligrams. And we also have our hemp heart biscuits which comes in oatmeal flavor. And our dogs absolutely love these. They're made with only USDA organic ingredients and they're human grade. So you can literally just open a pack and eat them yourself if you want to. Okay, and I have Lucy and Oakley here, my dogs, to demonstrate the treats. Who wants a treat? You guys like your hemp hearts? Okay, Oakley, sit. This is Oakley. Good boy, he says yes. All right, Lucy, come here. And this is Lucy. Good girl, sit. So clearly they're a hit. Plus we're really proud that all of our products are made with Colorado grown hemp. That was really important to us when creating this brand. We partner with local farmers to get the freshest hemp that we possibly can. And then we extract the CBD from that plant. And our products are gluten-free, they're non-GMO, and they're THC free. For humans, we have our best selling item, which is our gummies. And those come in two different flavor blends. We also have oils, we have CBD wax. And personally, some of my favorite products are our topicals. We have a roll on cooling gel and a salve. So definitely check that out. Our website is higherlovewellness.com. There's no code needed for this sale. We're just running 15% off until the 14th. Also, we are running a giveaway on our Instagram account, which is at higherlovewellnessco. Also, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has purchased something from our brand so far. You have allowed us to grow to this point and we are loving running this business. But let's go ahead and get into this case. Buckle up guys. It's gonna be a long one. So the Murdoch family, their name looks like Murdoch. It's pronounced Murdoch. And the father in this family is named Alec Murdoch, even though the spelling looks like Alex Murdoch. So just clearing up that confusion before we get started. Okay, so this family has been under intense scrutiny since about 2019. And let's talk about why. So since the 1920s, this family has lived in the low country of Hampton, South Carolina. This is a region along South Carolina's coast. It's very wet. It's a lot of marshland and swampland. And Hampton County is apparently the type of place where everybody knows each other and one person's business is basically, you know, everyone else's business too. I found that it's historically known for their watermelon festival. And that originated as a competition where people would come together to see who could spit a watermelon seed the farthest. And since the 1920s, the Murdoch family has held 
an important role in the legal system. For 85 consecutive years, one family member has held the title solicitor, which is the equivalent of district attorney. And for over a century, the Murdochs have really prided themselves on their ties to the law. And family pride in general is a huge thing for them. Alec, whose full name is Richard Alexander Murdoch, graduated in 1990 from the University of South Carolina with a degree in political science and also a Juris Doctorate degree. And within four years of graduating, he was admitted to the South Carolina Bar Association and became known for representing people in all areas of personal injury law. And one area in particular that he specialized in was wrongful death lawsuits, which becomes important later. And in addition to his own legal work, Alec also worked part-time in the solicitor's office for the 14th Judicial Circuit. So he kept that family tradition going. Alec met his wife, Maggie, when they were in college, and then they have two kids together, Paul and Buster. Buster was born in 1996, and Paul was born in 1999. And the Murdoch name is very well known in this area. And because of that, growing up, the boys were always very popular, well liked, you could say. I mean, by some, but definitely well known. And it was no secret in this community that the Murdoch family was super, super wealthy. Their family spent a lot of time hunting and fishing together. They even have a property together on 1,700 acres of land where they stayed while they were on hunting trips. And the Murdoch's wealth and legal connections definitely allowed them to get away with things that normally wouldn't fly. For example, Paul was big on drinking, even though he was underage. And while most parents tried to deter their kids from drinking underage, his parents totally encouraged it. In fact, they would buy him alcohol. And Paul's underage drinking is actually what initiated the domino effect that really changed the Murdoch family forever. So that brings us to February 23rd, 2019. Paul ends up borrowing his father's 17 foot boat and he takes a bunch of friends out on the boat. In total, there were three couples, Paul and his girlfriend, whose name is Morgan, Miley and her boyfriend, Connor, and then Anthony and his girlfriend, Mallory. They were planning to go party together. This was a typical like date night for this group of friends. So it was 6.30 p.m. when they all got together. And Paul, who was 19 at the time, got his brother's ID. And then he went to Parker's gas station to buy alcohol for the whole group. And there's actually surveillance footage of this. You can see Paul buying the alcohol. And then he's lifting up his arms like he's showing off the success of getting the alcohol as he heads back to his friends who are waiting for him in the car. And their plan for the night was to take the boat to a friend's oyster roast, hang out there for a few hours, and then head back to the Murdoch's family river house, which is not to be confused with their hunting house. That's different. So they go to this oyster roast. And while they're there, Paul is advised not to drive the boat back because he had been drinking heavily and people there were concerned. Also, it was extremely foggy that night and this boat did not have working lights. So it's just a recipe for disaster. But of course, Paul wasn't going to listen to that. He was a very confident type and became more and more confident the more he drank and was determined to be the one to drive them all back on the boat. And not only that, He decides that he wasn't drunk enough. He wants to go and drink more before they get back on the boat after the oyster roast. So out of this group of six friends, Paul and Connor both decide they want to go drink more. So they end up going to this bar called Luther's to take shots. And yes, they go take shots at a bar, even though they're underage. So they're out taking shots at this bar. The other four in the group are just waiting on the dock for them. And there's actually surveillance cameras that capture the 10 minutes that Paul and Connor are drinking. They finish up and they walk out of the bar just before 1 a.m. And then the whole group of six walk toward the boat. And then Mallory and Anthony were kind of the group stragglers, but they were clearly enjoying each other's company in these moments. So by the time they get on the boat, the other friends in the group say that Paul is just beyond intoxicated. And that's when his drunk alter ego comes out, which they call 
Timmy. Timmy was a nickname that his friends gave him when he had had way too much to drink. And even though sometimes drunk alter egos can be kind of funny and fun to be around, Timmy certainly was not. When Paul drank too much, he often became very aggressive and would sometimes take off his clothes. And that night, Timmy was out in full swing, and his friends said that he was just becoming more and more reckless as the night went on. So eventually he decides that it's a good idea to start driving the boat in circles. And several of the girls were getting freaked out and kept asking him to stop and he would just ignore them. Then he starts leaving the wheel unattended and walking back to yell at his girlfriend while the boat is still moving. At one point, his friend said that he walked up to Morgan and he spit on her, then called her a bitch. And they said that this type of behavior was normal for him, that he was a very aggressive guy. So according to their depositions, there were several times that Paul just walked away from the wheel while the boat was still in motion. And he also would yell at any of his friends if they tried to grab the wheel. And he would continually say, I am the only one who can drive this boat. And I guess during these times that he would just walk away from the wheel, Connor would sometimes attempt to take control of the boat, but you know, he never really actually got control of the boat. Paul would stop him. And that was really the extent of anyone else's control of the boat. So at one point, Mallory said that she felt unsafe and she asked Paul to take them back home, but he refused. So just around 2.20 a.m., they had been on the water for about an hour. And Paul, who was still driving, sped the boat through this narrow winding waterway in an area called Archer's Creek. And there was such low visibility that one of them, which most people think was Connor, had to shine a flashlight out in front of them. And then things went really bad. Before Paul had a chance to stop, he crashed the boat going somewhere between 32 and 34 miles an hour into the pillars of a bridge. And one of the girls, Mallory, whose full name is Mallory Beach, was sitting on her boyfriend's lap and he was sitting on top of a cooler at the back of the boat. And when they hit the bridge, she was actually ejected from the boat. After they kind of collected themselves, they realized that she was gone. And Anthony and the rest of the group just started to panic. It was also reported that Paul fell in, not completely sure on that, but you know, he was able to come up right away, get back on the boat. If so, Mallory was nowhere to be seen. So at 2.20 AM, Connor calls 911. We're in a boat crash on Arthur's Creek. We're in a boat crash. You know what, what kind of a? A boat crash. Okay, are you in the water or are you? We're, we're in the boat. Okay. We have someone missing. Okay. It's all in reference to a disabled, I'm sorry, a boat crash. It's six people on board. They currently have one missing. All right. It's in Archer's Creek, which is right there off of Paris Island. There's a bridge on Paris Island. They're underneath it. They crashed into the bridge. 10-4. I'll be in route to the Bell Bridge. Can you also notify Port Royal and oh, oh. PMO know as well? Affirmative, we're making notifications. Evidently, the girl was sitting on her boyfriend's lap when they hit the bridge at a high rate of speed, and now she's missing. He said the fog is pretty thick. That at first, he couldn't even find who they were. Find them. They're all looking for her. You know, they have their flashlight. They're hoping that she's somewhere around the boat. But when EMS and authorities arrive at the scene, Mallory still had not been found. Thing go up there. So y'all came from downtown through the creek, and that's Ooh. when going way too fast. But I don't even know. I finally got to the point I grabbed my girlfriend and put her in my lap in the bottom of the boat and was holding on with my eyes closed. The next thing I know I'm in the fucking water and I can't find it, man. And even though Paul was the one who was driving drunk, driving drunk under age, and also responsible for the crash, he was not the main focus for the authorities when they got there. He wasn't even given a field sobriety test and his phone was found in the bushes nearby and an officer found it. And instead of keeping it as evidence, they gave it back to him. And there's dash cam footage that captures Anthony, Mallory's boyfriend, telling an officer good luck because he knows that Paul's father would likely get him out of this. Y'all know Alec Murdoch? Oh, yeah, I know that name. That's his son. Good luck. And as it turns out, three of the responding officers that night actually had connections 
to Alec Murdoch. So EMS is out looking for Mallory's body and the other five are brought to the hospital. And this is when Paul is finally given a blood test to determine his BAC. And even though four hours had passed since the accident at this point, His blood alcohol content was still three times over the legal limit. And Paul's grandfather comes to the hospital and he goes from room to room and tells the kids not to talk to the police. There was an officer, of course, who was tasked with figuring out who was driving the boat. And Anthony tells them that it was Paul. And they ask Paul and he denies driving the boat. And he even says, why do you need to know who was driving? That's not going to help find Mallory. But there was some questioning over who was really driving the boat because Connor's name was brought up several times. As I mentioned earlier, Connor had tried to gain control of the boat because they all were fearing for their safety. And Connor would later hire a team of lawyers to file a civil petition claiming that he was being framed for the crash by the Murdochs and also that there were several officers involved in this conspiracy. And Connor and his team believed that the five officers purposely disseminated false information about the event with the intention of misleading the public and other law enforcement to draw confusion about who was driving the boat that night. Now, obviously, Mallory's friends and family are are just devastated that she is unable to be found. And for seven days, the Coast Guards and volunteers combed the marshes for Mallory's body. And finally, on March 3rd, 2019, after seven days of searching, Mallory's remains were finally located. And she was five miles from where she was first thrown into the water. 911, where's your emergency? This is Kenny Campbell. We're on the search rescue. We think we found her. And from the night of the crash, Mallory's family and other people in the community just knew that Paul would never face legal consequences for what he did just because he was a Murdoch. But of course, her family was going to try. They filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the bar and the gas station that sold them alcohol under age, and also against Alec and Maggie, Paul's parents, who, quote, willfully contributed to their son's underage drinking. And despite people doubting that this would actually happen, Paul was indicted for voting under the influence causing death and two counts of voting under the influence causing great bodily injury. And Paul was indicted on April 18th, 2019, which would have actually been Mallory's 20th birthday. But despite criminal charges against him, Paul definitely received special treatment. For example, he was never handcuffed in court during the arraignment which is a legal procedure. And he was also never brought into the police station for a formal mugshot. Instead, they took a photo of him outside of the courtroom on an iPhone 7. Then on May 6, 2019, Paul was brought back to court where he pleaded not guilty to all charges. The judge ended up ordering a mandatory mediation between Paul and the Beach family. This was on June 4th, 2021. And it was unsuccessful. And because it was unsuccessful, they had to go to trial. But the trial would never actually happen because three days later, Paul was dead. On June 7th, 2021, at 10.07 p.m., Alec calls 911 and reports that his son, Paul, and his wife, Maggie, were both lying unconscious near these dog kennels on their hunting property, and that they both had gunshot wounds. At this time, the Murdochs were staying at their hunting property full time. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child shot badly. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. Okay. And did you hear anything, or did you come home and find them? No, ma'am. I've been gone. I, I just came back. And you sure they're not breathing? Nobody's. They're not. Neither one of them's moving. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't, I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't, I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? I, I already touched them trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? How old is your son? 22. Okay. All right. We're, we're getting them out there to you, okay? And I will answer if you talk. All right. 
and news that the two of them had died spread very, very quickly. A murder mystery playing out behind the gates of this hunting lodge here in Colleton County as one of the most high profile families in the low country are mourning the loss of a son and his mother. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and Colleton County Sheriff's investigators have been on scene all day and night looking into a gruesome discovery on Moselle Road in Islandton late last night. SLED tells News 3 both had at least one gunshot wound. According to several sources, their bodies found by Maggie's husband and Paul's father, Richard Alexander Murdaugh. It was determined that Paul and Maggie died sometime between 9 and 9.30 that evening. And what's so strange is they were shot with two different guns. Paul was killed with a shotgun and Maggie was killed with a rifle. And obviously this property is a hunting property. So several guns were seized from their home. And it was later discovered that at least one of the guns that was used in this murder belonged to the Murdochs. So the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, commonly known as SLED, took over the case right away. And partly because the county didn't have enough resources to investigate a double homicide, and also because Alec was so well connected with law enforcement. And only a day after the shooting, SLED announced that there was no danger to the public. A SLED spokesperson tells me that while this is being called a double homicide, there is, quote, no danger to the public and that at last report they were not looking for suspects in the case. So the fact that police came to this conclusion so quickly led people to believe one of two things. Either they already knew who the killer was or the family had been specifically targeted. So one of the theories that people had right away is that maybe this was some type of revenge killing for the death of Mallory Beach. Just three days prior, that mediation meeting had failed. But investigators said that everyone involved cooperated fully and provided alibis and offered DNA samples to clear themselves of any possible connection. And the second theory that was really going around right away was that this was a revenge killing for the death of Stephen Smith. So let's talk about Stephen Smith. He was a teenager living in Southampton and he died back in 2015 and his death remains unsolved. It was July 8th, 2015, and his body was actually found in the middle of the street, six miles away from his home. And he was not far from his car and was found with the gas cap open, which made people and police believe that he had run out of gas. And the initial theory when that happened was that Stephen had been targeted because he was an openly gay teenager living in a very conservative area. So when they did an autopsy, his death was ruled a hit and run. However, many people, including some investigators, don't believe it was a hit and run. And that's mainly because there was no broken glass or car parts on the scene, nothing to really point directly to a hit and run. And so a popular rumor in the town was that one of the Murdoch boys had something to do with his death, specifically Buster, the other Murdoch brother. This rumor became very well known in the area and the police did try to track down, you know, the root of the rumor, but they weren't able to do so. So that kind of brought the investigation to a halt. And what many people consider strange is that one of Alex's brothers, who is also a lawyer, called Stephen's dad and asked to take on this case free of charge. But eventually the case went cold and the police weren't able to tie anyone to Stephen's death. So it was rumored that Paul and Maggie's murders were connected to Stephen's death somehow, that this was a revenge killing. And that was fueled even more when SLED announced that they were reopening Stephen's case as a result of something that they found in their investigation of Paul and Maggie's deaths. And it's very frustrating, but whatever they found that makes them believe that there's a connection here has not been announced to the public. But what is confusing about this theory, obviously, is that Paul and Maggie were the ones who were killed, but Buster was the one who was rumored to have something to do with Stephen's death. Now, the third and final theory when it comes to Paul and Maggie's death is that Alec Murdoch, father and husband, had something to do with it. And definitely at first, this was the most believed theory, considering he was named a person of interest within 48 hours of their deaths. But of course, his legal team has said from the beginning that he 
was cooperating fully and that he is not considered a suspect. And Alec and his team has also said from the beginning that he has a rock solid alibi, even though at first he didn't explain what that alibi was or where he was that night. However, later on it was reported that he was with his mother who has dementia. So then 10 days later, Alec's brothers end up going on ABC News to beg the public to come forward with information. I got a call from, from Alec Monday night. And as soon as I had the phone, I knew something was wrong. Oh, man. He just told me, he said, come as fast as you can. Paul and Maggie have been hurt. His voice, the fear, he was just distraught. But the person that did this is out there. And there's information, however big or however small it is. Did they have any enemies? I really don't know of any enemies you hear all this talk on the, you know, social media with regard to Paul, but I don't know of anybody no. that would truly, that would truly be an enemy or truly want to harm them. And they mentioned that Paul had received death threats just weeks before, but they don't believe that these threats were credible. By June 25th, 2021, a $100,000 reward for information leading to an arrest was posted by Alec himself, but the reward had a deadline, and that was September 30th, 2021. But what's weird is that between June and September, Alec never made a public appearance or commented, asking for the public to come forward with information about the murders of his wife and son. And of course, that has caused a lot of speculation. You would think that he would be out there in any way he could, begging for information, but he wasn't. So two months after the double homicide, solicitor Duffy Stone recuses himself from the investigation. And as solicitor, he would have acted as the prosecutor in the case. And he cited that there were quote, developments in SLED's investigation that led him to this decision, although he didn't state exactly what those developments are. It is a decision based in legal ethics. My relationship with them uh, as victims of this crime, uh, as potential witnesses of this crime, does not conflict me out of this case and does not put me in a position of having to step aside. Stone says he only decided to step aside from the case after consulting with University of South Carolina legal ethics professor and expert Dr. Greg Adams. I knew that there was a, an ethical issue and I needed advice on it. I got that advice and I followed the advice and um, that's what prosecutors are supposed to do. Uh, you don't just get out of a case because it's uncomfortable or because People are saying you should. But a lot of people believe that he recused himself because he discovered evidence that may have pointed towards Alex's guilt. Of course, that is not confirmed, but I wanted to note that because many people think that. But he did say that something definitely changed in the case that led him to that decision to recuse himself. But he said that telling the reason exactly would violate his ethics. There was something that changed before you sent that letter to That's the Attorney correct. General's office. That's correct. It's something you can't talk about. And I cannot tell you what it is. It would not be proper for me to tell you what it is, because then I would be violating the exact same ethics that I have followed since the very beginning of this case. So if I asked you, does it have anything to do with the suspect in the case? I wouldn't tell you. If I asked, it had to do information in, in uh, evidence that was found in the case? I wouldn't tell you that either. How complicated is this case? The event happened, what, two months ago? Nobody's been arrested? That should answer your question. I think you sign up for this job recognizing that you're not always gonna make the popular decision. And I'm gonna make the decision that I think is right, and I'm gonna stick with that, and I'm comfortable with those decisions. But then what happens next is absolutely insane. On September 4th, 2021, while on his way to Charleston, Alec Murdoch was shot in the head on the 15,000th block of Salkahatchee Road. Now, this gunshot wound, which was not fatal, was said to have just grazed his head. So I guess, you know, minor, even though he was shot in the head, but he was still able to call 911. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? On um, Salkahatchee Road, so I got a flat tire, mm -hmm. and I stopped. And somebody stopped to help me, and when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay. Were you shot? Yes, but okay. I mean, I'm okay. So as you could hear, according to the call, Alec had pulled over to take care of a flat tire. That's when a man in a blue pickup truck pulled over, walked up to him, shot him in the head, 
and drove off. So of course, when Hampton County authorities found out about this, they were certain at first that their family had definitely been targeted all this time. But that theory started to unravel pretty much immediately. And that's because the story from his PR team just wasn't adding up. For example, his team stated that as a result of the gunshot wound to the head, he temporarily lost his vision and he was in the ICU because, quote, his life was in danger. But turns out he was released two days later. So many questioned right away, how could that have been true if it was so bad, if his life was in danger? Then a statement comes out that says he is going to be resigning from his law firm. This is just like out of nowhere. He announces that he has been battling addiction for two decades and it has gotten much worse because of the murders in his family. And so he is going to rehab. This morning, a new twist in the mystery surrounding a double murder involving a prominent family from South Carolina. Alex Murdaugh, whose wife and son were killed in June and who called 911 over the weekend saying he was shot in the head, is now breaking his silence, releasing a statement saying, the murders of my wife and son have caused an incredibly difficult time in my life. I've made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. I'm resigning from my law firm and entering rehab after a long battle that has been exacerbated by these murders. I'm immensely sorry to everyone I've hurt, including my family, friends, and colleagues. But the truth behind his resignation stems from the fact that his law firm, PMPED, which was founded by his great-grandfather, actually asked him to resign on September 3rd, just one day before he was shot. The truth is that the firm began an investigation into Alec on the 2nd, after finding a suspicious check on his desk, and they quickly realized that he had been misusing company funds and stealing from clients. So on the same day that Alec releases his statement, the firm releases their own clarifying. His firm said he is no longer associated with PMPED in any manner. His resignation came after the discovery by PMPED that Alec misappropriated funds in violation of PMPED standards and policies. So the South Carolina bar and SLED were made aware of Alec's conduct and his license to practice law was suspended pending investigation. So this investigation would be in conjunction with the investigation into the murders of his wife and son, and also the investigation into who shot him. Through all that, Alec still says that he is going to be going to rehab. So hopefully you're not too confused at this point. I know, there's a lot going on here, but only 10 days after Alec was shot, they actually made an arrest. It was 61 year old Curtis Edward Smith, a former client of Alec who was arrested, but his arrest came because of a confession. On September 14th, Alec admitted that the attack was a suicide attempt orchestrated so that his son Buster would receive a $10 million insurance payout. Alex said that his drug addiction was made worse by Curtis, who was selling him the drugs. And when he asked him, Curtis took advantage of the opportunity to help him stage his suicide. Curtis was arrested, but he told police a different story. He said that Alec set him up. In his version of events, he was asked to meet him. And when he arrived, Alec asked him to help him commit suicide. Curtis said that he refused. And then he said that Alec made a move like he was going to shoot himself. So he actually wrestled to get the gun from him. And that's when it went off. And he told police that he is 1000% certain that the bullet didn't hit either of them. Curtis said he drove away following the incident, and that's when he said Alec must have dialed 911. And there actually was a couple who had witnessed this and called 911 to report a man who was bleeding on the side of the road. And they actually told the dispatcher that this man was waving on the side of the road, but it seemed like a setup to them. So they continued driving and just reported it. Yes, um, we're on Sakahatchee Road, and <laughs> there is a man on the side of the road with blood all over him. He looks fine, but it kind of looks like a setup, so we had to stop. That brings us to September 16th, 2021. Alec ends up surrendering and turned himself in to the Hampton County Detention Center. And he sat before a judge and was read the charges against him related to his suicide attempt in order to commit insurance fraud. The cases that we have before us today, Mr. Um, uh, Murdoch is case number 2021 A25101 00204. Insurance. 
false statement misrepresentation. In case number 2021-8251010206. Conspiracy. In case number 2021-8251010207. Filing for a false police report of a felony violation. And in court, of course, his lawyers pointed to his addiction as a major factor in why he did what he did. It's a 20-year addiction. This is not. This is something he's struggling with every day. Um, and if anyone uh, wants to see the face of what opioid addiction does, you're looking at it. Uh, this, this, uh, this is a horrible, horrible disease. And eventually he was let out on a $20,000 bond and sent to rehab. But it doesn't end there, people. At the same time that Alex surrenders, another lawsuit comes forward accusing Alex of several other crimes. On September 15th, 2021, Alec was sued by the sons of their former family housekeeper, whose name is Gloria Satterfield. And Gloria had been their housekeeper for more than 20 years. She also helped raise Buster and Paul and played a big role in their family. She was very close with them. But on February 2nd, 2018, Gloria was found at the bottom of a staircase in their hunting property home. Maggie was actually the one who found her and she called 911. 911, where's your emergency? Uh, 4147 Moselle Road. What's going on out there? Uh, my housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. She fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so she outside or inside? Outside. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. And unfortunately... Gloria did not survive. She actually succumbed to her injuries three weeks later. She passed away on February 26, 2018. And according to Alec, Gloria fell down the stairs after tripping over their family's dogs. And Alec also told Gloria's sons that he felt responsible for Gloria's death. And so he had a plan. He tells them that they should get a lawyer and that they should sue him for her wrongful death. And remember, he specializes in wrongful death lawsuits. His plan was for them to sue him for $505,000, which his insurance company would pay out. And this would, you know, give her son's money to support themselves after the tragedy of losing their mother in this horrific way. And they followed through with that plan. The Satterfields hired Corey Fleming, who is actually Alex's former law school roommate, to represent them in this wrongful death lawsuit. And as their attorney, Corey convinced the Satterfield boys that there were financial matters in this lawsuit that would be better handled by a banker named Chad Westendorf. So Corey convinces them to sign on Chad as their personal representative. And as a result, he would be able to make all the legal decisions for their family in court. Very quickly, Corey and Chad began making settlements in the case that the Satterfield boys were never made aware of. Just a day after he was appointed their personal representative, Corey actually filed a petition in court where he asked a judge for access to a partial settlement in the wrongful death suit for $505,000 while reserving the right to pursue additional insurance coverage coverage that is applicable to this matter. So essentially he's asking the judge to grant them access to the initial settlement money while he continues to work on getting more money for them. The petition was granted, but the Satterfield boys never saw this $505 thousand dollars. The check came on January 7th, 2019, and it was made out to Chad Westendorf. He, instead of transferring it to the Satterfields, then funneled $403,500 of it into a bank account named Forge. Literally, it was called Forge. Turns out Forge was an account set up by Alec to funnel money, stolen money from his clients. And it was designed to mimic a real business, which was actually called Forge Consulting. And it legitimately paid out victims after winning settlements in court. And the hope was that nobody would notice the difference between Forge, Alec's personal account, and Forge Consulting, a real financial firm. Uh, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, it appears back in 2015, set up a bank account with the Bank of America in the name of Richard Alexander Murdaugh, DBA Forge. And it appears that this account was nothing more than a, an illusion, a fabrication, in order to create the illusion that these checks that he was getting in various settlements were going to a legitimate settlement consultant 
when in reality they were going into an account that he controlled. And that's how this scheme was, uh, was took place in this particular um, case. And the hope was that nobody would notice the difference between Forge, Alex's personal account, and Forge Consulting, a real financial firm. A second settlement was reached in March of 2019 with an insurance company for $3.8 million. And once again, the Satterfield boys were never made aware of this because the check was made out and given to Chad and the firm Corey worked for. So between the two insurance companies, there was a total of $4.3 million won in the wrongful death lawsuit. And 2.7 million of this was legally awarded to the Satterfields. But instead, that money, and more was sent to the Forge account. So finally, in October of 2020, Corey and Alec filed to dismiss the settlement, stating that all parties have come to an agreement in the lawsuit. Judge Carmen Mullen approved of this dismissal, stating that she believed the Satterfield boys had received their payout and were ready to end the lawsuit against Alec. But all that time, they knew nothing about this money or this dismissal. So when Alec began facing public scrutiny for misappropriating company and client funds, the Satterfield family found out that a settlement had been reached and they were shocked. So at the same time that Alec is facing charges for staging his own suicide attempt and a attempting to commit insurance fraud. He was named the chief defendant in a new lawsuit made by the Satterfields. Um, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Murdaugh, as you may know, is a longtime lawyer in the state of South Carolina, uh, does a lot of uh, tort work. And at the funeral of Ms. Satterfield, uh, Mr. Murdaugh tells the family, hey, she fell at my house. It was because of the dogs. It was my fault. And uh, I'm going to take you to a lawyer so that y'all can uh, file a claim and get some compensation for the death of your mom. And he takes uh, the boys to a friend of his, a very close friend of his, a person by the name of Corey Fleming. Luckily in that lawsuit, a settlement was reached. So Gloria's sons received 100% of the money. And on October 1st, 2021, it was agreed that the Satterfields would receive $4.3 million for Gloria's estate. And SLED also announced that they are gonna be doing an investigation on Gloria's fall. Turns out there was never an autopsy done. So all of these lawsuits and investigations are happening at once. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. It recently came out that while the $3.8 million settlement was underway, Corey asked the same judge who later dismissed the case not to file the paperwork associated with the settlement. Not filing the settlement with the county clerk would keep it off public record, which they claimed they wanted because of the boating incident that had just occurred. They said there would be, quote, unwanted scrutiny of Alex assets and finances. When in reality, keeping it out of the public eye is going to allow them to continue their illegal activity without anyone noticing. So this was only made public after the Satterfield's new lawyer discovered the cover-up. So now Judge Mullen is being accused of being involved in Alec's scheme to defraud the Satterfields. That's how deep this goes. Alec is also facing several more charges and lawsuits from his former law firm. On October 6, 2021, they sued him for the money that he stole from their clients over the years and funneled into the Forge account. On October 14th, he was arrested and charged for his connection to the funds stolen in Gloria's wrongful death lawsuit and initially charged with two counts of breach of trust. And in a bond hearing on October 19th, Alec was denied bail and ordered to undergo psychiatric evaluation. Meanwhile, the charges against him for conspiring to commit insurance fraud during his suicide attempt went to court. On November 4th, 2021, Alec was indicted for filing a false police report, conspiracy, and false claim for payment. Curtis, his alleged shooter, was indicted on assisted suicide, assault, and battery of a high aggravated nature, pointing and presenting a firearm, insurance fraud, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. Once again, at that point, Alec was denied bail. And on December 9th, 2021, 21 new charges were brought up against him, including nine counts of breach of trust, seven counts of computer crimes, four counts of money laundering, and one count of forgery. These new charges are all related to crimes that he committed against his own firm and clients. And by the end of 2021, Alec Murdoch had a total 
of 48 indictments against him. And it was discovered that he had defrauded an amount surpassing $8 million. And Corey Fleming has also been indicted on more than 30 criminal charges. And he's lost his license to practice law and faces prison time for his involvement. Now, as for Alec, at this point, he is currently in custody at the Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center. And his request to lower his $7 million bond has been denied. And unfortunately, that's where we got to end today's video because things are still unfolding in all of these cases. There's so many investigations going on, so many lawsuits, and there's no update as of right now to when his trial will take place. So he will remain at the detention center until that date is picked. But I am so curious to know what you guys think about all of these different cases, all of these deaths. I mean... <sighs> This is so insane. I still feel like there is so much more here in all of these situations that we just don't know that, you know, this family is being protected in a lot of ways that Alec was able to just pull strings. It's great to see, you know, this unraveling for them slowly, but I mean, more is going to unravel over time. So yeah, I wish there was more that I could tell you guys. I have so many questions here, but I want to know what you think. Definitely leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts on this one. And eventually I'll probably do some type of update video, hopefully, or maybe follow this up with a podcast, an episode of my podcast mile higher one day, because this it's intense. And I'm very curious to know what my husband Josh would think as well, because yeah, I've just a lot of thoughts, a lot of things to think about here. But that is going to be it for me today, guys. I hope you were able to hang with that one. I know it was probably really confusing, especially towards the end. I know all that legal stuff can get very tricky, but I hope you found it as interesting as I did. I will be back next week with another video. Until then, stay safe out there.